This is problem 10-75E. It's on page 601. A large food processing plant requires one and a half pounds per second of saturated or slightly superheated steam at 140 PSIA, which is extracted from the turbine of a cogeneration plant. The boiler generates steam at 800 PSIA and 1000 degrees Fahrenheit at a rate of 10 pounds per second, and the condenser pressure is 2 PSIA. Steam leaves the process heater as a saturated liquid. It is then mixed with the feed water at the same pressure, and this mixture is pumped to the boiler pressure. Assuming both, uh, oh no, assuming both of the pumps, both the pumps and the turbine have isentropic efficiencies of 86%, determine A, the rate of heat transfer to the boiler, and B, the power output of the cogeneration plant. Cogeneration is an interesting idea. It's sort of like an uh, open feed water heater, except that the purpose is a little bit different. When you, when you have a large enough company or a large enough organization or building complex, sometimes it's beneficial to generate your own electricity. Uh, that is something that can reduce costs and improve reliability of electrical supply. But also, if the process, whatever business you're in or whatever uh, you have, requires heating as well, well then cogeneration is a way to provide this. So basically the idea is, could we generate some of our own electricity and at times when we don't need the heat for our process, use that energy to generate more electricity, save money on our power bill, but then say during wintertime, let's just say we need heating for buildings, okay. Um, during winter time, when we want to use the energy generated in the boiler, the thermal energy from, say, burning coal or natural gas, could we then simply redirect that and use it to heat the buildings, you see? Now, in this particular application, the setup is that the need for the, the process, in other words, the, the part of the system that requires thermal energy just for whatever the need is, that's a constant demand whereas I suggested a seasonal demand for heating buildings. And the rate at which uh, uh, steam is needed for whatever this process is, is one and a half pound miles per second. So we gotta provide thermal energy for this process. Now, along the way, uh, oh, they said this is a large food processing plant, so maybe this is baking bread or something. And this is needed at 140 PSIA. So we need this mass flow rate of steam at 140 PSIA. Now let me draw or sketch the cogeneration process itself. I'm going to try and leave enough space for both the schematic of the system as well as the uh, TS diagram. So here's the turbine and we can take bleed steam off the turbine what I'll label state seven, and let me put some label numbers on this diagram as we go, for process heat. So here's our process heater. Okay, and this is the, the, the part that needs one and a half pounds mass per second. So we know the mass flow rate in, seven, in, in state seven. That's really what we were given, you see. And this needs to be at 140 PSIA, so we, we know that this is the pressure at state 7, you see. Now this process heater, once it's done with the steam at state 3, which will be a different uh, state for the steam, the steam is just reintroduced or re-injected into the process to go back and return to the boiler through a pump. to get back into the boiler and then back into the process. See? So here's our boiler. I guess I'll try to rack sideways. Not a very good E, but there it is. Okay, so there's our boiler. And the remaining steam expands to state eight in the turbine. So all of the steam in state six comes into the turbine. Some of it expands to state seven. And so then 15 or 1.5 pound mass per second goes this way. The rest of it, whatever that may be, goes through state eight 
to a condenser. So it expands farther from state 7 to state 8, uh, producing more work out of the turbine. So we get power output from the turbine. And then goes to the condenser to uh, be condensed and waste heat from away, of course, to go back into the mixing chamber. Now this would be state 1, and I think I've got almost all of my state numbers listed. Oh, I forgot. This is at a higher pressure. So we will need a pump in here in order to bring the fluid up to a higher pressure. So that'll be uh, state two. And let's see, one, two, three, uh, four is here, five, six, seven, eight. There we are. So we have state numbers for all the different points in the schematic where the state of the steam will change. If I were to draw a TS diagram, of this process, of course it would be uh, relative to the vapor dome, and we are in English units, so this would be degrees Fahrenheit instead of Celsius. It would all be rel relevant to or related to the vapor dome, where uh, we were told a few things along the way. Um, let's see, the boiler generates steam at 800 PSI, 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, at a rate of 10 pounds per second. So what they just told us there is that the mass flow rate through state six coming out of the boiler is 10 pound mass per second. And of course, by mass balance in, in the, the turbine here, if 10 pounds per second comes into the turbine and one and a half comes out this way, well then eight and a half must be going this way, right? So we can immediately deduce that the mass flow rate in stream eight must be eight and a half pounds of mass per second. And of course, streams one and two have that same mass flow rate. Stream five will have this, and stream four will have the same mass flow rate as stream six. So what did I say? Four, five. Sorry, I'm squeezing all this together. And then obviously, stream seven and stream three have the same mass flow rate. And I think that's all of our states. Let's see, did I get one and eight? No, I didn't. So eight and one, yes, I did. There it is. Mass flow rate of eight, one, and two are all the same. Okay, so we got eight and a half pounds mass per second going this way, one and a half going this way, and then all of it, all 10 pound mass per second going that way. Okay. Now they told us that the turbines and or the turbine and the pumps are not isentropic. In fact, in fact, they gave us an isentropic efficiency for both the pumps and the turbines, just to make our lives easy, I guess, of what 86 percent. They told us a little bit more information, and I read it and then didn't write it down. Let's see. 800 PSI, 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, uh, things are going to get pretty messy pretty quickly. So let me, let's see. Let me put a table over here. And uh, put, uh, I want to write down some state numbers, but I need to leave myself some space. Something interesting is going to happen here. Uh, two, three, let's see. There's actually going to be another state in there, and I'll explain why that is in a moment. I'm trying to figure out which states I'll need to reserve some space for. I need to reserve some space for two, not for four. I'll need to reserve some space after five. So six will be down farther. Um, six should be fine. Seven will need some space. Eight will need some space, and that's, that's it. So this will be my table. So here's the state numbers. And the various things we can keep track of are things like temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit, pressure in PSIA, uh, obviously enthalpy in BTUs per pound mass will be very useful to us, as well as entropy uh, in BTUs per pound mass per Rankine. Now since we're dealing with a system working around saturation, the quality may be useful as well, but I didn't leave myself enough space. So I'll just put quality on the other side. 
And along the way, we'll know where the quality is relevant and irrelevant, and perhaps what the values are if we, if we really care. So let's separate the table out just a little bit. There we go. And now I've got a place to start writing down some of this information. For example, the pressure in state 7 is 140 PSIA. So I'll write that down here. And let's see, I'm going to put a line across here, one here as well. There's another state I'm going to add. You'll see why here in a moment. Uh, let's see. So every two states or so, I'm going to try and put a dividing line. There we go. Hope we've got enough state room for states one and two. So 140 PSIA is the pressure at state seven. And what else have we been told so far? Just mass flow rates. So that should be good. We were told that the entrance to the turbine, the boiler produces steam at a pressure of 800 PSI. IA. So that's state six, 800 PSI, and a temperature of 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So just filling in what we've been given so far. There was another piece of information, let's see. The condenser pressure is 2 PSIA. So the condenser pressure, that's down here on this side. So that's uh, state 8 and state 1 that would have the condenser pressure of 2 PSIA. So we know the pressure at state 8 and at state 1. So let's see, what did I say, 8 and 1? So condenser pressure, 2 PSIA, and state 8, 2 PSIA. And there's one other piece of information tucked in here. It says that the steam leaves the process here as a saturated liquid. Now beyond that, they don't tell us a whole lot. If the steam leaves the process here, that's state 3, as a saturated liquid, then what they've told us is that state three has a quality of zero. So I'm glad I added this in, this will be useful. I'm sorry my state numbers ended up embedded in the chart. That's okay, I like to have my state numbers at the beginning. But this is fine, we'll deal with it. Now, the, the steam, once it's been condensed, understand that there's a saturated vapor liquid mixture in the condenser, and so at state one, what comes out is just the saturated liquid. So state one is also known to be a saturated liquid. So I'll put the quality there of zero. All right, now what did they want us to find? Well, the questions were the net power output and really not the power output from the turbine. I understand we have work going into this. So let me not put that there. Let me say the net power output. Understand these two things are different. Some of this power has to go back to drive the two pumps. That's a pretty sorry pump. That's a little better. Okay. So what we're going to do is just go from one state to the next with what we know in order to determine anything else. For example, uh, state six is an easy one. We know the temperature and pressure. As a matter of fact, Turns out that that represents a superheated state of steam. So we can look up the enthalpy, for example, that's easy. It's 1512.2 BTUs per pound mass. We can look up the entropy in that state. It's 1.6812 uh, BTUs per pound mass per ranking, and that's easy. State one is pretty easy because state one is a saturated uh, liquid state at 2 PSIA. So if you look up the enthalpy of state one, it's 94.02 BTUs per pound mass. Of course, that's the enthalpy of saturated liquid at uh, 2 PSIA. There is some other information that I don't have in my notes. I'll add, I'm going to go to the English appendices and look up saturated steam at 2 PSIA. See, there's superheated water. Here we go. Uh, page 966. At 2 PSIA, I'd like to know the temperature just for my own reference. 126.02 degrees Fahrenheit. And the entropy, let's see, this is state one, so it won't really matter 
where you're really interested in entropy is around pieces of equipment that should be isentropic. For example, the turbine and the pumps ideally would be isentropic. And so since we're just looking at the condenser, I'm not really interested in the entropy there. I won't bother with it. But those two states, state one and state six, are very easy to get enthalpies for. How about state three? Well, at state three, what do we know? Well, state three has to be the same pressure as state two. And I don't know that they gave us enough information to figure out anything about that, unless I've missed something. Uh, let's see. Oh, I know. We know the pressure at state seven, right? So we know that the pressure at states two and four have to be the same. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't mix. Now, this process heater, what we're assuming is that it acts a lot like a condenser. See, the way the condenser works is waste heat comes out of it. But the process heater has process heat flowing out of it. And the reason they told us that state three coming out of the process heater is a saturated liquid is because they're using, using primarily the, uh, the latent heat of vaporization of the steam as what's generating the process heat. So once all of the steam has condensed, it's not useful anymore for process heat. It has no more energy in it to extract, unless we take its temperature down, which is not all that beneficial. So state three will come out as a saturated, so it's, it's kind of like there's, I'll just put a line between here to indicate, there's also a saturated vapor, vapor liquid mixture in the process heater, you see. And so it functions a whole lot like a condenser, it's just instead of throwing away heat, we're using this heat to do something useful. And this is cogeneration. This is the whole idea behind cogeneration. The, the, the concept comes from the idea that, wait a second, this heat we're throwing away in the, the classic condenser or simple Rankine cycle may not be useless after all. We may be able to use it for something. As a matter of fact, it may be so useful, that's the whole, that's one of the primary purposes of having a boiler. And by the way, if we attach a turbine, we could generate our own electricity and save some money. So anyway, um, the point here is that this is a saturated vapor liquid mixture, and so the pressure at state seven and state three will be the same, as well as the pressure at states two and four. So we actually pick up several pressures from that line of reasoning for these states. So state seven, let's see, state three is also 140 PSIA. State two, uh, which is up here, is 140 PSIA, and state four is 140 PSIA. So now we have enough information in state three to determine anything else we want to know. Because look, we've got 140 PSI pressure at saturated liquid. So if we look up the enthalpy, for example, at state three, we just need the enthalpy of uh, saturated, saturated liquid. And that is 324.92 BTUs per pound mass. Now, again, since I'm dealing with, let's see, state three, I don't really care about the entropy here. It's not around a pump. Any state around a pump, four, five, for example, two, one, I will care about the entropy. And, oh, except that I'm typically going to use an isotropic pump work equation. Let me just give you a quick preview. I'm going to calculate the pump work from V delta P. And so this already includes isentropic behavior in it. Obviously I have an isentropic efficiency, I'll have to modify this a little bit, but rather than going through and saying S1 should equal S2, this equation already has that built in. So I won't actually have to worry about the entropy in states one or two because it's built into this equation. Same thing for state four and five. I don't really care about the entropy in those two states. Um, I don't care about the entropy in state three. Because again, in fact, the only place I'll care about entropy is around the turbine. So states six, seven, and eight will be the only states where I care about entropy. So we've already got six there, there's seven and eight. And so, um, yeah, so you'll see why I cross it off in other states. You'll see why I've got two, well, three, four blank spaces here in a moment. <clears throat> okay, speaking of the pump work, we can calculate how much work is required by pump one, or the specific work, 
by just using the specific volume of saturated liquid at state one, or I could say, I guess, P1, multiplied by P2 less P1. So let's go through the details of this calculation. Uh, the only problem is, notice that this equation so far is talking about an isentropic pump, but we're told that these pumps are not, in fact, isentropic. Now, for the pumps, isentropic defi uh, efficiency is defined as the uh, work that the pump should require over the work that the pump actually requires. So it's the, here's the isentropic specific work over the actual work required to drive the pump. And if this is the isentropic work, which that's what this is, it's an isentropic equation, then what that means is that the actual work, just flip these two around, would be the isentropic work divided by the isentropic pump efficiency. But the isentropic work is V delta P, you see. So if I want to get the actual work, I will have to divide this by the isentropic efficiency, and that will give me the actual pump work for pump one. So that's why I'm going to divide this by the isentropic efficiency. So now I need the specific volume of saturated liquid at P1. If you look that up, you'll find it's 0.01623 cubic foot per pound mass. Just to make the math a little cleaner, I'm going to move the isentropic efficiency just under that term mathematically, it's the same. And then P2 less P1, well that's 140 less 2 PSIA. So you see what units we end up with are cubic feet PSIA per pound mass. Now a cubic foot times a PSIA is a dimension, is the dimension energy. Uh, but we're using BTUs, that's what we prefer. And so uh, to perform that conversion, I'm going to encroach on my chart temporarily here and then I'll erase it. Um, there's one BTU for every 5.40395 cubic foot uh, PSIA. And so the cubic feet and the PSIA go away and we're left with BTUs per pound mass. So if you plug all this into your calculator, you'll find that the isentrop or not the isentrop, the actual work required for pump one is about 0.4819. BTUs per pound mass. Okay. So that's how much work is required for each pound of water that flows through pump one. Well, what are we going to do with that? Well, we can calculate the enthalpy in state two because understand that this is also equal to H2 minus H1. All the work that pump one does goes into the liquid, right? Even if the pump is not isentropic, the energy that goes into the pump, because this is operating in steady state, has to go into the water. That's the main thing that would cool it. Now, in the real world, obviously, there would be some heat loss from the pump, and that would have to be accounted for, but we're neglecting that. And so the enthalpy in state two would be the actual specific pump work plus the enthalpy in state one. And since we already have the specific actual pump work, we can simply add this to the enthalpy in state one to come up with the enthalpy in state two. Now, I am going to cross this state off, not because I'm getting rid of state two, but because I would call this state 2s. But I don't really care about state 2s. I don't care about what this calculation alone, without the isentropic efficiency, would predict for H2s, if that makes any sense, what the ideal enthalpy would be after the pump. I don't care about that. I care about the actual uh, uh, enthalpy. And that's what I'm calculating here, right? Because I've got the actual pump work. If I add that to H1, that gives me the actual enthalpy in state two. So when you go through and you do this, you'll find that the enthalpy is about 94.50. So it doesn't, it doesn't move up very far from state one. Okay, again, don't care about entropy in this state. The pressure will actually be 140, it has to be. And then the temperature, uh, I, I'm not gonna bother with that. And of course, there's no need to talk about the, uh, uh, the state, uh, or the quality there, because 
there wouldn't be a quality. Let me work on the TS diagram for a minute so I can make some sense out of this for you. So state one is going to be down here on the saturated liquid line. That's right here, which makes sense. It's a saturated liquid because it just came through being a, you know, a vapor liquid equilibrium. It goes through pump two. And what pump two does is ideally it would raise it isentropically. Now in the real world, it's not isentropic. Let me flatten out this vapor dome just a little bit so this will make more sense. Ideally, pump one would move up vertically, right? But instead, pump one moves up and increases the entropy of the fluid. You see the difference? So if this, if both of these points, these states, are at the same pressure of 140 PSIA, then this is state two actual, and this would be state two isentropic. Now, I don't really care about state two isentropic. I care about what's really going on. But you notice the temperature is a little higher than it should be, and the entropy is higher than it should be. I hope you can see this on the camera. Now, of course, what's going to happen then, let's see, I, I need to, sorry, I need to modify my dome just a little bit more so you can see this. I'm really going to have to exaggerate. But what happens here at state two is saturated liquid from state three is mixed with it. Well, where's that at? Well, if we extend this pressure line, then this point would be state three, you see. That's the saturated liquid line, uh, liquid point, at the line of 140 PSIA. Now, of course, over here somewhere, this is supposed to be a horizontal line, all at 140 PSIA. I think I'm going to have to cheat again that up a little bit. What's going to happen is the uh, stream from state seven, whether it's, I don't know if it's on the line or if it's slightly superheated, it doesn't really matter. State seven is going to be somewhere over there. Most of the move from here to state three occurs in the process heater because this is where we're giving off the process heat. But then at state three, a saturated liquid is mixed with a subcooled liquid, so you end up at state four somewhere in between the two. Okay, so this is state four. I'm going to have to pull the line off so you can see it. And what happens is this pump, the second pump, will pump up ideally, it would be isentropic, but in reality, it pumps up and increases the entropy sum. Okay? So that'll pump up to the next pressure level. Again, state 5A will be at a higher temperature and pressure than it should be. Here's state 5S. You should have ended up here, but our pump's not isentropic. And so this line represents a line of pressure going through the boiler of, let's see, what is the boiler pressure? Would they say 800? Yeah, 800 PSIA. So state five has to be at 800 PSIA. But it's at a higher temperature and a higher entropy than it should be. So here's the move right here from state one to two A. That is pump one. And from state four to state five A is pump two. Now, of course, heat is transferred in from state 5A all the way up to the superheated state for the turbine. Now, I've drawn it above the critical point. I sh I, it shouldn't be above the critical point. I'm sorry. Uh, let me pull it down a little bit. I may have to. Uh, but I think this will work out. So ideally, the turbine would be isentropic and the drop of the steam through it would, would just drop along a vertical line on the TS diagram. So this would be state six. But in reality, we do not have an isentropic turbine. So the entropy of the steam as it moves through the turbine increases. Now, state seven, as I've drawn it right now, ends up being outside of the vapor dome in the superheated region. I don't know if that's true. We'll find out. And I've got state uh, uh, eight after the turbine inside of the vapor dome. Again, 
no guarantees of this. We've got to go through the, the cycle diagram and study it to make sure this is the case. If it's wrong, I'll mess up my uh, vapor dome further, I guess. But there, understand there's a state, this is state 7 actual, and this would be the state 7 isentropic. Okay? Similarly, there's a state 8 actual.